You're very welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast. This is episode number 28. Uh, this week, we've got a, a, a really interesting guest with us. He's a well-known, highly successful coach throughout, especially the Leinster region and around Ireland uh, at colleges level, club level, and also at inter-county level as well. Um, current vice principal of Good Council College. I can't list the amount of teams that he's working with currently or in the last few years, so I won't even try. Um, my, my coaching mentor and my playing mentor, Aidan O'Brien, is with us. So very welcome, Aidan. Thanks very much, Karen. You're very welcome. Good to see you. Good, good. Um, so we try, we tried to get the instigator of, of good football down in Wexford in colleges level and inter-county level to bring him on the show, but unfortunately Kevin Kyo couldn't make it this week. So you're you're here with us instead, Ed. Yeah, I'm sure I probably have uh, tried to fill the, the boots or be a, an, a, an ample substitute for Kevin on a number of occasions and uh, I'm sure he'd be uh, somewhat uh, bemused at the notion that uh, I would be talking to you about such things when it really should be him. <laughs> well, the, fir the first question is, do, do you, your generation of, of, of coach, do you know what a podcast is? And second of all, the Department of Education know that you're using their time to um, come on and chat, chat about coaching to me. Um, well, answering the second part first, the Department of Education are getting full value for their money, <laughs> where I'm concerned. And uh, I'll be here long after uh, <laughs> the recommended hours this evening and the sure. evenings. But uh, as for knowing what a podcast is, yes, I've heard about it. <laughs> I remember, for, for uh, obviously for the audience, they, um, they, they, I'm sure they wouldn't know, but so you, I, I got to know you, well, from a very young age, but... Uh, coming into Good Council College in New Ross in County Wexford as a 12-year-old. Um, you were our coach all the way through at, at colleges level schools and, co and colleges level up to the 18. And then a, a few years later, then you got involved with our club with Horswood in Wexford. And, and we went on to, to have a very successful period, most successful period, and in, in certainly in our, our history of, of the club. So... Um, Definitely, I wanted to get you on at, at some stage to have a chat through, through coaching. So we'll, we'll touch on a few things about um, your coaching career and even on, on your playing career as well, which I want to mention as well. And then just some things about how to, how to develop a successful team and, and the environment around a, a good team and going on that journey with a group of players. Um, I, I will mention, before we jump in, we'll mention... Uh, thanks very much to our sponsors, Ripped.app as well. At all stages, they're on board with us um, and showing us great support. We need to pay the big wages to bring the big guests on the show. So um, luckily, we've got sponsors supporting us at all stages. So, so Aidan, you're, you're a, a more or less at this stage, you're an honorary Wexford man. You've been in Wexford now for many, many years. Um, you probably hit the national headlines initially when you helped steer a Wexford football school to All-Ireland um, success, or uh, All-Ireland A College of Success with Good Council College. Um, do you, shall, we, shall we start there just about your time with, with what happened? Well, let's, let's go actually with your playing career first, and then we'll move on to, to Toman College and, and, and Good Council College. So, so I remember at one stage you said to me as a player with your career, you wish you had focused more on yourself and your own football out on the pitch rather than marking your man and just doing your job and everything like that. What, what, what did you mean by that? Um, okay, yeah, I, I, I think that I probably may have said that. Um, I suppose what I really meant by that at the time was that when I think back at my own days playing inter-county, which were... Uh, you know, um, I played for Westmead, obviously that's where I'm from originally, and I didn't play for them for a great number of years, but I did play for them for a few years, and you know, typically I was wing back for Westmead during those during that period. We would have been very much uh, a Division Four team at the time. We would have been right down at the bottom of the of the of the the, the food chain, really. Uh, although you know we had a few notable days. 
Um, and look, as a player myself, I suppose playing wing back and recognizing my own limitations, my my initial uh, default position was to try and make sure I didn't get skinned and didn't uh, sort of uh, come off the field having been exposed badly, which could very easily happen. I mean, uh, I was marking players that were far better than I was, uh, far better footballers, quicker, yeah. uh, more skillful. And I suppose uh, I was really just beset with a sense of um, wanting to not be uh, badly exposed and obviously felt that maybe I could contribute best to the team by just making sure the guy I was marking wasn't uh, doing too much uh, damage uh, to us. Yeah. Um, you know, I yeah. would have marked at the county level, you know, you're playing against maybe the likes of Vinnie Claffey of, uh, of Offaly. Yeah. I remember marking uh, Colm O'Rourke actually in a Bourne Cup game one day. Um, in college, I, I I remember having the, the unenviable task of of trying to mark Barry Coffey a few times. He was playing for UCC at that stage when I was in Tormund. And I suppose what I meant by the comments that I made to you were looking back on it now, you know, perhaps uh, it would have been more gratifying and there may have been more satisfaction to be got from having had a bit more of a go myself, let's say, get on yeah. the ball or look to be involved more. I mean, there were games, I would say, that I played back in those days where I hardly kicked the ball, yeah. but uh, my man probably didn't <laughs> kick yeah. it very often either. You know, yeah. it was very much defending that day, that, that time, whether you were a cornerback or a wing back, in those days, you were a defender. I mean, yeah. the notion of um, attacking wing backs and so on was, uh, wasn't was uh, born at that particular stage. So yeah. I suppose that was what I had in mind. And, uh, I envy the the, the, the half backs nowadays who get to indulge themselves and express themselves and get forward and uh, get so much involved in the play. Now, obviously, given my limitations, I'm sure I wouldn't make a, a modern uh, inter county team to uh, be able to uh, carry out the tasks that the, that the current wing backs uh, carry out. But there you go. Yeah, well, uh, I always remember you had a sweet left foot down in the training pitch anyway. Uh, is show, shown at different times. Um, it's yeah, it's an interesting point you make because if I think back to my own career, at times if I wasn't fit or coming back from injury or maybe going through a, a lull in confidence or something, it, it was a real problem when you started focusing on the opposition player's game rather than your own game. And what I found was that you you really instead of going to try and get on the ball yourself and looking to get involved yourself in the game, you spent as much time kind of worried about your opposition player, your marker, and what damage he's doing in the game or what damage he can do to you. Um, and usually it didn't end up kind of in a, in a good way. It's, it's funny because when I look at now the lads in QPR and, and the sport of, of soccer, you're constantly involved in the game, like you, you get so many touches on the ball that you have ample opportunity to express yourself. And maybe if you're not good enough, to probably show that you're not good enough as well. But it, it, I think it can be a problem in Gaelic at times that it can be difficult to to get on the ball for for certain players. I, I suppose that's true. Yeah, but I suppose at the top end nowadays, uh, it's more. Um, uh, you know, there's there's more opportunity for players, no matter what positions they play, to um, you know, to express themselves, to uh, you know, uh, deploy the the range of skills they have. I mean, we've seen you know cornerbacks or one merchant march forward and stick the ball in the net in the All Ireland replay. I mean, you yeah. see wing backs repeatedly get forward and uh, cause lots of damage. I mean. Wing backs, winning forwards. Listening to Stephen Poacher there last week, I mean, he re was referencing the, you know, the previously where wing forwards would drop right back and wing backs basically be the ones to do the attacking. And um, so, look at um, the game has changed, and obviously it's evolving all the time. But from the time I played, let's say thirty years ago, uh, to to now, I mean. There are players and types of player who would have been uh, getting their places on teams um, back then. 
wouldn't um, yeah. wouldn't make an intercom team now. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, not, I'm quite sure I could probably it. <laughs> to be honest about it. But um, equally, I suppose there were forwards. There were, I mean, there were players who played up front in those days. Very skillful players who certainly wouldn't be seen on a, an intercounty team now, simply because of the the, the physical uh, challenges. But now, obviously. You know, every um, every game, every sport, every athlete really operates in the time in which they, they live. And, you know, we might look back at games from the past and think that the hurlers back then or the footballers back then wouldn't lace the boots of the modern footballers. But I suppose those guys were as good as they needed to be in that era. And yeah. if they were given the opportunities to develop as modern players are, they probably would have been just as good in the in the current era, you know. Yeah, well, I suppose you, you can see that in the hurling even as well. Of a, like we're in a brilliant era of like Joe Canning and TJ Reid and guys like this and and the stuff that they're doing on the pitch and the scores they're they're racking up. I mean, it's it's comparable to any player in history. But people will always go back to Christy Ring and Nicky Rackard and and. You know yeah. whether they romanticise about that, I'm not sure because, as you say, like what would Nicky Racker do in the current era, for instance? Well, look at the same could be applied to any sport. I mean, uh, Roger Bannister when he broke the, the four minute uh, mile. I mean, are we to assume that if Roger Bannister was born in, uh, you know, 25 years ago and was and was running now that he would only be able to run a four minute mile I've no doubt that that's not the case I've no yeah. doubt that he would be again uh, one of the foremost athletes in the world but uh, at that particular time that was the, the standard and he 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 broke through a, a barrier and, and 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 you know set a new standard and as such he was the greatest of his particular uh, time and yeah. you know um that's just that's that's all anyone can be, you know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I would assume, never having seen Christy Ring playing in the flesh, that he was a spectacular player, uh, and that uh, if he were around today, that he would accommodate the the modern game and uh, be equally uh, gifted and, and, and wonderful. Yeah, exactly. I suppose that's why, as well, when people say that no, that there never be another. Christy Ring or there'll never be another Roger Federer, I, I'd be very careful of ever saying that because like one sports star inspires the next generation and, and like look at the Dublin team, the current team now, you know. Yeah. Well, I agree, I agree. And look, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the skill levels, the athleticism, uh, the, you know, the, the speed of the modern game of football and hurling and I mean rugby, obviously. I mean any field game. It's 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 it, it's much higher than it was. I mean, just to watch the modern hurlers, watch the Limericks, the Galways, the Wexford, Kilkenny, any of the top sides, and the just the skill levels in terms of the touch, the accuracy. Uh, you know, it's phenomenal. And uh, likewise in football, I mean, the movement, the power, the pace, the you know the. Um, Skill levels are, are far far higher. I mean, the, yeah. the efficiency. I mean, and it's that's being that's happening in the face of uh, greater challenges in the sense that the opposition are also um, stronger, yeah. faster, fitter, or whatever. And uh, you know, to be able to uh, you know exercise that sort of um, skill level uh, or deploy it in those circumstances is 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 it's very impressive. You know. Yeah, you said to us once that Matt O'Connor from Offaly was w one of the best, if not the best, players you, you, you ever saw, or the way he played. Yeah, well, I've no doubt, like, I haven't changed my mind since, I can assure you. Yeah. Uh, Matt O'Connor was the best player I've ever seen. Yeah. And I did see him on a few occasions. I never played against him. Um, but like, even when you look back at some of the old All-Ireland Gold games, He's the one player that even still stands out for me with the gracefulness of his movement, um, the, the accuracy, the finesse, the left foot, the right foot. Uh, and I think the thing that really 
uh, appealed to me was the sheer modesty. Uh, you know, you'd never see him celebrate or anything like that. And the volume of scores he racked up for his club and for his county was extraordinary. And I suppose a skill that was very much in vogue that time that has sort of died out to some extent, since, not exclusively. I mean, all frees were taken off the ground at that time. Mm. And it wasn't at all uncommon for players to take sidelines off the ground, as they had to be, and put over the bar. Yeah. And in fact, a guy from my own club in Westmead, uh, he subsequently he, he got a, a dual all-star uh, replacement award one year. It was a guy called Willie Lowry. I mean, I remember Willie Lowry in a Leinster club match uh, taking a line ball off the ground against Port Leash, actually, and, and scoring with his right foot. And from the opposite side of the field at a later stage in the game, taking one with his left foot mm. and also scoring. That's incredible. Incredible, incredible. You, you don't see that skill as prevalent in the game now because it's obviously being able to take freeze from the hands now is the case for a large extent. Yeah, and it, 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 it's a, it was and is a brilliant skill. You know, if you think back to the free takers down the years, very famous. Yeah. Can, can, can I jump back then to um, Tolman College? And like, I'm not going to say what years you were there, but during that period seemed to be like the amount of really successful coaches, um, but managers, but also people like at the, the, the highest levels of sport ireland or the national coaching and training center as it used to be called like it seemed to be a really a kind of a flourishing era for coaches like was that where was that where your initial kind of coaching journey be, began then as like starting as a p teacher yeah, well obviously that's where i i i attended college um, and trained as a p teacher and like i mean i think i probably had um uh, an inkling or a, a longing for coaching, if you like, uh, prior to that, because even in my secondary school days, I went to a school called St. Finian's in Mullingar, and it had been a, a very strong footballing school, uh, you know, back in the 60s and so on. But while I was there, it really had fallen back towards the bottom of the of the of the the, the hierarchy in a football. But we we competed, and like I remember playing. Um, against Carmelite Moat in a Leinster Championship and they had John Maughan, Val Daly, uh, they had several other well-known players from Westmead and Offaly and they only beat us narrowly but we were very much left to our own devices in school because there really wasn't anyone to take care of the teams um, and uh, I remember coaching in, as a sixth year, a first year team in what was called the Brother Hubert Cup. And we got to the final and uh, were beaten by St. Mary's Mullingar by a point. And I always felt that uh, we were actually robbed. And it was the fact that they had a teacher over their team that made the difference. In the uh, something happened. I won't even bother going into it now. But uh, I feel we were hard done out of it. And that sort of whetted my appetite, obviously. for doing it. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but obviously, look, at in Tormund, it was the only PE and training college in the country time and it was I suppose somewhere that people who were interested in sport and interested in coaching and interested in that field were naturally going to um, be drawn to and um, you know while I was there there were some fantastic people uh, there in my time uh, and obviously prior to my time there they had especially in football obviously they, they had won the All-Ireland Club football title um, back in the late 70s uh, uh, I yeah. was there in the, in the mid, early to mid 80s and um, look at they had a, a, an incredible team Pat Spillane Brian Talty Brian Mullins to name but a few Mick Spillane I think um, uh, several other uh, really well known players uh, so they were a phenomenal team and yeah so I suppose you're in an environment where you're training to be a PE teacher but mm. I suppose it's only natural that in tandem with that given that you have a, an interest in sport, coaching uh, is going to be um, something that you would be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. It's, uh, I mean, there were some brilliant characters, and as you say, players who came, came out of that era. You, so you, you, you took a job in, in Retford and in Uros uh, in Good Council College, and I'm interested because I know Good Council College were successful prior to you coming and, and some other teachers 
down through the years, but it seemed to really quicken the process then at that stage. And, and like, I, I suppose what the audience are interested in and the listeners are interested in is thinking about a school and a college from a, let's say traditionally a weaker county like Wexford and how, how teams from that college then could go on to compete and will win multiple Leinster titles, all Ireland's, and I think it's just interesting that that kind of process. Do, do you want to just mention a little bit about those kind of early years and and what were some of the like what were the structures that were put in place, or or how did it come about that actually this this school became so successful? Yeah, well, well, obviously, Good Council had always you know been. Uh, been involved and, and had had a certain amount of success in in in, in colleges uh, football and hurling, but um, it, I I started there in eighty six and you know it certainly wasn't down to me that uh, that they became um, you know as successful as they were throughout the nineties and forties and so on. I suppose the, the circumstances that allowed us to become a strong colleges force were. A, we had a principal who was very um, uh, keen uh, to see the school successful and who didn't uh, take kindly to defeat. Uh, so that kept his coaches motivated because you heard about it when uh, you didn't win. So uh, Father, uh, Father John Cosgrave, who were, we, were, we were petrified of, but if you were a good footballer or a good hurler, you were, you were okay. You got a pass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose there's a certain amount of truth in that. Uh, obviously, uh, I didn't experience Father Cosgrave as a student, but I, I certainly did as a teacher. And um, uh, I can assure you that the staff were just as petrified of him as the students were. But he had, uh, he had, look, Father Cosgrave was one of those men who, uh, when he wanted to achieve something, whether it was getting buildings done here around the school or whatever it was, he sort of got it done. And yeah. uh, he certainly um, would have uh, motivated us in the sense that he, you know, encouraged us, uh, um, had expectations in terms of what we were doing with them, uh, you know, but also supported us in the sense of, um, you know, um, ensuring that, you know, we had whatever we needed from the point of view of resources and so on. Mm. But we would have put in a huge effort. And I mean, like there were, I suppose the key, I always think that the key to a, a, a college being successful is it comes down to teachers within that school. I mean, you won't find a, a school in Ireland that is uh, winning a choral at festivals year after year without identifying a teacher in that school who's responsible for driving that in that direction. Yeah. Uh, equally, schools that do well in um, debating, you'll find that there's a teacher in the school who's passionate about that and drives that particular uh, uh, area. And yeah. the same here in our place, we had a number of people, uh, you know, like Mick Purcell in the hurling, uh, Andy Dunn was there at that time, and uh, then myself, Brian Teague, uh, in 93, then Kevin Kyo came in. So there were, and there are many others since, uh, yeah. obviously, who have contributed hugely. So there were a lot of people here, I mean, who were willing to put a lot of time and effort into it. And I, I mean, curiously, you know, you see some schools who maybe struggle to get people to take responsibility for teams and extracurricular. Yeah. But here, you'd nearly have to uh, apply with a CV uh, to get it over a team at times. You know, there's a lot of people who are willing to give their time freely and uh, get involved with teams. And like uh, moving away from the, maybe the, the, the topic slightly, I mean, from a teaching perspective, I mean, for me personally, my experience uh, of education over the years and the rewards I've got from it have been accentuated greatly by being involved uh, in extracurricular activities. I mean, it allowed me to get to know students, obviously, in a different context. It allowed me to get to know some of their families better. It just establishes relationships with students, which obviously then makes it possible to do more work with them in other areas. It's just a fantastic thing to be uh, to be able to do. Now, look at 
uh, it was probably easier then than it is now with you know all the other demands that are on on people uh, and so on but so at that time then there were the secret i suppose to us succeeding was that we had a principal who was very supportive we had a number of uh, staff who were willing to put in the time and effort and i mean i'm talking about effort that um, involved when we would come back from a game we didn't just drop the lads off at the school gates and have them make their own way home i mean you'll know that we we serve very much a rural um hinterland here and our students come from you know uh, you know as far away as 20 and 25 miles you know all the way out to timon and down to mullinavash and swinging right around kilkenny there and what have you but we would actually drive them home yeah. so i would take i didn't have a car of my own in those early years but uh, there was a, a car there in the school that i'd be given and I would drop four lads out to Glenmore. Then I'd come back and there'd be a few lads waiting and I'd drop them off out to, I remember I used to drop Larry Murphy to Paul Pasty and uh, <laughs> other lads out to Raheen and out to yeah. Notes and all these places. And it actually gave me a great um, insight and a great early lesson in the geography of my local uh, community. And yeah. all of that has been something that has been very beneficial to me uh, over the last 30 years here in, in, in my no. yeah. So those are, I think, the things that, um, that have allowed uh, us to, to move forward. And like in 86, when we started here, um, Good Council were operating in B grade in hurling and football. Uh, by 89, yes, we won the under 16... E football in 89 uh, by then by 1990 in those three four years we had moved to a in everything and had already started winning a titles the only exception was the senior football and we remained b in that until 93 when we won the all ireland and so by 1993 we had now won everything that was to be won in b and we had already started picking up some titles in a especially in the hurling yeah. And to the year after we won the Be All Ireland in '93, I remember thinking we had a fairly good team. And uh, a good friend of mine was teaching, and still he's principal now in, in St. Mel's at Longford, who were obviously the kingpins. And I said, you know, we get a challenge against St. Mel's because, you know, I think we're good enough to be operating against these guys. And we played St. Mel's in a friendly, and he gave us a lesson. And it opened my eyes to the gulf that needed to be breached in terms of the, the, um, yeah. through the uh, A, uh, top of A. But by 95, we were in the Leinster A final and uh, we won it. And we won it again in 96. And as you know, we went on then in 99, uh, won the Leinster again and won the All-Ireland. Yeah. So those were great times, uh, great years. And uh, uh, you were involved yourself in 99 and... We might mention 2000. <laughs> Was that where I'm, I'm still being blamed for not win, win, bringing an All-Ireland back to the school by certain members of staff? <laughs> yes. well, well, in truth, we had a brilliant team in 99. Yeah. We felt we had an even better team in 2000. Yeah. You know, in 99, when we won the Leinster, or sorry, won the All-Ireland, we were the first Leinster team in 13 years to win the... Uh, the All-Ireland College's title. And uh, I think it sort of maybe opened the eyes of few other schools who thought, geez, if these guys can do it, I, other, we can do it. And yeah. obviously, you know, it was Pat Sinavin who beat us in that semi-final in Carlo in 2000. And yeah. uh, we let it slip. We, were, we should have won that day, no question. And, yeah. and Pat, interestingly, went on to win the All-Ireland that year. And I do remember Colin yeah. O'Rourke after the game speaking to us and saying that, you know, essentially we had sort of, um, uh, you know, made them aware of the possibilities uh, by, yeah. uh, you know, uh, ploughing the furrow we had ploughed the previous year. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, there was a great, there was a moment in that game when a certain... Uh, Wispish forward from Horace Wood bore down on goal and uh, somehow... Um, uh, she hit the post, was it? The post. Yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway, look it, at... Uh, it must have been deflected, I think. It must have been. Uh, 
uh, you have been um, you have been rejected from our records here and <laughs> well you know, I forgive you and Kevin Kyo till, still talks about the killer Kyo <laughs> when he I met him I met him in Wexford Park I think the summer before last and and the first thing he said to me was that <laughs> after really? after any success with Wexford or or you know working in in with London or QPR, and that was the first thing you mentioned. <laughs> so, I, that, still, that still hurts. I, I, well, no, no, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, indeed, you made a you made a good contribution while you were here. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 it's interesting about Pat's and Avon because, like, when you look back at those team sheets, you often see. Like Jesus, he he played that day and he played that day and you know I remember we beat um, was it St David's or St Declan's in Dublin and uh, 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 as you say a whisp a whispish wing back he was actually that day uh, had a penalty in the last minute to beat us two points behind and I think put it wide and who was it only Alan Brogan. That's right. That's right. It was he didn't put it wide. He actually hit the post, and it was right. literally, and I mean literally, the last kick of the game. The ball rebounded off the post, and it rebounded so hard that it nearly went out to the middle of the field. <laughs> and the referee blew the final whistle. I re never forget it. I remember yeah. it cost me a stopwatch because <laughs> we were winning that day, as you know, going into that final moment, and the ball went a high ball went in, and it dropped in the square. And Kevin Stafford actually went bent down and he handled it on the ground, picked it off the ground. Yeah. And I flung my stopwatch on the ground in <laughs> exasperation and broke it. And uh, Gary Conway was in goals. Alan Brogan stepped up, took the penalty, hit the post, game over. And we went on and won that final comfortably against uh, against Ramaris at Lone. That's right. But those are the fine margins, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And did, I, I think Alan Brogan, that at that time or just afterwards, he said... Go Council College, the bane of me life. We were at that time for him. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah, they said that to me once afterwards. <laughs> but it's, it's just interesting to look back. And I know some of those lads from Navin who went on to play intercounty for Mead said that they, they won in All Ireland that day, you know, down in Carlo in that quarterfinal. And, and they actually went on to win two in a row all Ireland's because they won the nice. following year when, when we were involved again. Yeah. But in, in some ways, it was, I, I think of our time back in Good Council as you got an education, obviously, and a, and a really, really good education. And there's, it's no coincidence that a lot of the schools who do well at sport do well academically and extracurricular things and you know, it's, it's good people, it's good structures. Um, but aside from that, we, we got an education. We got an education in football. That's what I thought. And that when we entered into the school, it was like, wow, this is, this is a whole different ball game. <laughs> this, is, this is not club. And I always thought from, from the age of 12 to 18, I mean, colleges were far more difficult than county. I always thought it was a far better game, a more difficult game, better players. And in ways it was, in some ways it was, the, it's the purest form of sport and the purest form of hurling and Gaelic football because fitness didn't come into it as much. And, you know, the, the different aspects of it. It was just, it was pure sport. And that, that's why it's lovely thinking back at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, young players at that age. I mean, there's less, there's no cynicism really. Yeah. They just want to play, and they play with a degree of freedom. And obviously, from a coaching perspective, working with schools boys is so much easier mm -hmm. than working with, um, you know, well, working with maybe adult intercounty players, for example, because, you know, the, obviously, young players at that age, they're much more willing to listen. They don't think they know more than you or they you know they 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 sort of put their faith in you to know what you're talking about and to guide them in the right direction and to you know um, obviously you know they, they they are more easily motivated and they're more easily um i suppose uh what would i say uh cajoled into sort of really they buy into um the the, the 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 idea of uh, representing their school and you know they become very 
proud, I think, of wearing the school jersey and so on. And it means a lot to them. And yeah, obviously, um, you know, that's something as well, I suppose, that made it possible for us to uh, become a little bit of a self uh, propagating thing in the yeah. school. And that, you know, the younger players wanted to emulate the older lads and they would go to the games and see the, the, the razzmatazz and the drama of it and the excitement of it. And yeah. And, uh, beyond the school team and what have you. Yeah, so it was great. Yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting linking in with that, that at that at that period, I would have been far prouder playing for Good Council College and bringing, putting on the, the blue and white stripes of Good Council College than Wexford even, because you could just identify with, it was your school, you could identify with the team. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, yeah, of course, you have a close bond with the lads that you're uh, playing with. They're your your friends that you're sitting with them every day. You can obviously uh, indulge the um, the success and, and and sort of absorb it. Uh, it the day afterwards when you all meet back in school and talk about it with each other. You know, you, you have more. You're obviously together much more than you would be even with a club group because. Uh, yeah when you're in school obviously you're you're there every day and you know there's there's um there's the capacity to build a team in a more uh complete way uh, even if it isn't within a shorter time frame than um and maybe as possible always at, at, at intercounty yeah, yeah. or even club level yeah yeah the, the the local girl school coming along to support you in the big games that that used to help a little bit as well Obviously, but we, we, I we, think, I think that was Niall Collins, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the great Niall and Steve Collins. <laughs> the, the, the last couple of things just on that, on that period that I wanted to mention about, I think once, and it's important when you're thinking of building team success and everything, like once there is, has been a little bit of success in ways, then you're kind of setting the bar high for everybody that comes afterwards because you're setting a kind of an environment of excellence and tradition. So, for instance, in the sports uh, uh, building, then there would be pictures of that 1993 team, you know, with brilliant players, the 95 team, the 96 team, Jason Lawler and Lee O'Brien and David Shannon and Richie Purcell and, you know, going back well before that even. And it, it, it as you say, it's self-propagating in some ways then that, the players who all come behind and are looking at that and say, well, that's, that's the level, isn't it? That's what I want to attain as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, obviously, look, at, uh, the, that's, um, like, if you think back to the um, to that period that we were referring to, like, when, when the lads won their first senior title in 95, it was also the year we won our first ever Leinster A under 14. Mm. And... Uh, we won that up in Carlo after extra time against St. Michael's and Trim. Yeah. And I think Darren Fay may have been playing for Trim at that time. Yeah. And, uh, we then won the under 14 again the following year. And that, that, that team, so we won our first senior in, in 95, uh, A, uh, the team who won the first under 14 in 95 and won it again in 96, they became the team that won the senior yeah, All-Ireland right. in 99, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there definitely was a continuity and a continuum there. Uh, yeah. And obviously the older lads were inspiring the younger and so on, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to mention that day then in 99. Uh, like how fitting was it that, I think it was the last Colleges A final held in Croke Park, I think. But also because of clash of colours between Go Council Blue and White Stripes and St. Charlotte's in Galway, that Good Council had to wear Wexford jerseys. And how fitting was it that, that it was a Wexford jersey in football that was winning in All-Ireland? Well, look at it, obviously, I suppose at the time, we didn't really mind uh, what jerseys we were wearing, provided we were, uh, we, we were still, it was Good Council we were representing first and foremost. And I suppose you must remember that there were uh, three or four Kilkenny fellas playing with us that day. Yeah, uh, and they didn't mind pulling on the Wexford. <laughs> and in fact, there were two Wicklow lads playing. 
yeah. uh, Kieran Highland, who went on to have a stellar career with Wicklow, Wicklow yeah. and who I remember particularly fondly here. And Kieran, Kieran never played football till he came. Yeah. And Philip Gleeson, uh, likewise yeah. Philip from Arklow, was also playing. And then you had Michael Phelan from Kilkenny and the late Keith Madigan, Lord of Mercy, yeah. in the centre back. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we had Kilkenny fellas, Wicklow fellas, Wexford fellas. Uh, yeah. But they were fundamentally with council fellows. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it was the last uh, game. Uh, I, we did play in Crow Park and it was televised and so on. I'm not sure if they have uh, played any uh, yeah. colleges finally in Crow Park since. I'm not sure of that, to be honest. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so because they were, they were refurbing the, the, the stadium and everything. And it's, it's interesting when you say about that, like if you're to think of an All-Ireland A colleges uh, backbone by Wexford footballers and then you're adding in Kilkenny, Wicklow and not that year but many other years Waterford as well mm. and it, in ways it shows the purity of schools and colleges and that it, it doesn't always matter where you're born <laughs> like you don't have to be a Kerry footballer or a Dublin footballer that there's loads and loads of talent in, in every county and like for instance I remember going going to UL a, a, a year or two after that and going to the first year year's team and there was a second year you know in charge of it like there always was in, in, in um, third level then and he was a Kerry guy and when I said I was from Wexford he had a laugh he had a laugh at me and I just thought I was raging because I thought well who the hell does this fella think he is just because he's from Kerry he thinks that yeah. he's better than me um, so it's an interesting one. Well, look at there you go. I mean, uh, I mean, in in more recent times, um, we've had uh, success at All Ireland level. The under 16s won the All Ireland there. Oh, it must be six years ago now, and um, they beat um, uh, St Brendan's Killarney, and uh, <coughs> David Clifford was playing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had a guy playing that day called Tom Also Connor, who is now with Southampton. Yeah. soccer club and uh, he was probably the star of the show that day yeah any man yeah he was the most outstanding player on view that day i i, I think he everybody spoke about him he was a phenomenal footballer thomas yeah. from kilkenny uh and uh you know like you say <clears throat> like over the years like here some of the best players we would have had football were kilkenny fellas i mean some fantastic players now obviously they ultimately went back to uh, concentrate on hurling by and large and many of them went on to be very good hurlers you know I mean Walter Walsh was a fine footballer um, you know Jerry Edwards scored 1-4 for me in a, in a Leinster final uh, you, you know Kieran Joyce all of these guys were exceptional footballers mm. um, and I suppose they would have been good at any sport um, but um, no there, there isn't a, there's no I suppose colleges allows you to overcome the um, limitations that might be there as a county. Uh, and yeah. I suppose even club does to some extent. I mean, you can see clubs from counties that would be considered weaker counties mm -hmm. who over the years have competed very favourably, like Aero Oak from Carlo. Yeah. Uh, you've had, um, uh, you know, was it Balting Glass and Wicklow uh, were a super side. Uh, you know, there have been teams who have booked the trend in the sense that it's because they're from a county that has uh, is labelled as a weak at a particular sport. Uh, they haven't uh, conformed to that as a club or indeed ourselves as a school, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, it's, it's very true. I have to mention before moving, because I want to come on to Tomas O'Connor, actually. My, my dad was a, a very conflicted feelings that time in ninety nine with uh, St. Charlotte's of, of, um, in, in Galway because he was, he was captain of their under-14 team back in the day of St. Charlotte's and had to, because his dad took a, a job in, in, uh, in Loch Ray then in, in south of Galway, he had to move school and he was devastated. And he, went, he ended up picking up um, rugby in, in uh, Garbally. I think it was Garbally. Garbally, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, well, look, uh, yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know your father had gone to St. Charlotte's, but sure, St. Charlotte's of June were the um, 
you know, they were the, the top side in the country for so many years, and I, yeah. I, they may still have the record for the most All Irelands. Uh, I think they, so. They, yeah, uh, nominal side. And I suppose look, they wouldn't be as prominent now, uh, and it's a reflection really on on how the thing has changed overall in the last twenty years. Like when I went to school, I mean, colleges football was really the the domain of the old um, sort of um, diocesan colleges that, you know, the, the St. Peter's and the St. Kieran's and the Good Council and, the, or sorry, uh, St. Binion, St. Jarlett's, uh, St. Pat's of Cavan and so on, St. Brendan's of Killarney. But obviously the nature of secondary, second level education has changed hugely over the last uh, number of years so that now you know there are schools that may not have even existed then that are uh, competing and uh, winning uh, titles and you know the demographics have changed uh, hugely and um, some of those old schools like um, Knockbeg College uh, not Knockbeg but Ballyfin sorry up in Leash doesn't even exist as a a school as such anymore I mean Things yeah. have changed very much in that regard, you know. Yeah, I think that uh, also, and I want to bring in the Tomas O'Connor and Everling Angle as well, now that it was probably like a criticism of that, uh, of previously was that PE was Gaelic football hurling and maybe when the GA season was finished then uh, you played a bit of soccer you know, on, on a, a Friday afternoon or whatever it is. And I know, like, and from speaking to you, how different PE is now in that there's so many different sports being played and there's so many, as you mentioned, like extra uh, curricular activities in a school. I mean, it, it's changed. The focus has changed somewhat in schools as well, hasn't it? Uh, well, it has, of course, and... Look, I suppose there's a much greater understanding of um, what PE physical education should be. I mean, actually, in in, in good counsel here, there, there was no timetable PE until myself and Brian Teague started teaching here in 1986. And look, we would have, um, you know, uh, done PE in, in, in the sense of doing lots of different activities. I mean... I remember, you know, doing basics and gymnastics and obviously we were doing court games, field games, athletics, yeah. we were doing a range of different activities, um, you know, within the context of the PE programme and, you know, just trying to educate young people in terms of their movement, in terms of, you know, uh, trying to uh, uh, consider the activity uh, in their lifestyle and yeah. so on. And, you know, that has become much more, um, I suppose, much more embedded now. Yeah. And sure. Now, uh, like, for example, this year we have, with our fifth-year cohort, uh, offered uh, PE as a Leaving Cert subject, right. um, which has only been uh, on, it's only been available for the last two years, uh, and we now are, are, are one of the schools who are offering that. Uh, previously obviously that wasn't an option but it's it's great that it has become an option uh, and uh, you know it's obviously something that would suit certain uh, students uh, yeah an interest in that area um you know i suppose look at sure sport i mean you know yourself having gone on to do a sports science degree and uh, and and much, much more beyond that the whole world of sport as a as a i, I suppose a a phenomenon, uh, an industry has just uh, grown out of all recognition in terms of, um, you know, the possibilities, the, uh, you know, the, the levels of expectation. I mean, obviously, it's it's not a, it's it's a different discussion, but, um, you know, whether it's for better or worse, it's hard to say. I mean, yeah. but uh, in terms of a school and its offering of PE, well, I think it's 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 essential that you would. Yeah, no, uh, it's so important. I mean, the the the, the recognition of, of of the importance of well-being and uh, uh, you know that is obviously something that's uh, very much I- embedded in the in the new junior cycle curriculum in schools. Uh, you know, obviously, it's there's a greater awareness of that, and as such, PE is forms a huge um, uh, element of that. You know, 
Yeah, it's great. It's great to see now the amount of work that's going into like people's mel- mental health and, and well-being and the positive effect of exercise on those things. And, and you can see that that's embedded in schools now and, and bringing in people to speak to students. And it's, it's fantastic to see. It's, it's interesting to see in Good Council that some of the most famous ex-students are not GA players or anything like that, but Tyg Furlong has gone on to be a lion <laughs> and play for Ireland in rugby. Uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Doyle, obviously, in, in the same year as myself, went on to have a, like a brilliant career with Ireland and, and obviously with Wolves and Reading. And as you mentioned before, Tomás O'Connor, I just see actually a couple of days ago, I think he was announced in the Ireland under-21 uh, uh, soccer squad for the upcoming games and seems to be I've, I've kind of kept a close eye on his career he's doing well in the under 21 team or under 23 team with Southampton so it's mm. and obviously as well uh, a lot of famous jockeys and, and um, horse trainers yeah yeah no we have uh, we're very lucky in that there have been a number of um, uh, students who have gone on to achieve great things in, in, in the world of sport and you've mentioned obviously Tig in the rugby Kevin in soccer. I mean, Greg Bulger. I get a, yeah. give him a shout out. Greg uh, won his, I think it's his third um, League of Ireland medal uh, yeah. last week with Shamrock Rovers. He already has four FAI Cup medals. Uh, then you have people like um, mm-hmm. who's also playing soccer. But look, we would have had a hell of a lot of lads who have achieved a lot in hurling and football as well. Mm-hmm. You know, particularly in hurling, I suppose, which several all stars have gone through the place. Uh, I think the last three times Kilkenny won the All Ireland hurling title, uh, the man of the match was the past people of the year. Wow, amazing! Um, you know, so there's lots of um, lots of good, uh, lots of people have gone on to do uh, uh, well in sport. And there would be lads here, uh, Adrian O'Connor, a past people. Here. Um, I'm in the Olympics for Ireland. Yeah. One year, the year Ty was here actually, and he's looking third year. I remember taking a photograph. I think we had seven lads who were Irish internationals in seven different sports. Uh, there was show jumping, badminton, rugby, swimming. We have a boy who was on the Irish water polo team. It was I can't remember it, it, all of them just off the top of my head. So you know, we've had we actually had two years ago here. One of our leaving cert boys was Irish national men's high jump champion. Wow! Which was under eighteen, but the Irish men's champion. You know, well, there are lots of um, lots of talented lads. Look at I'm sure most schools have, you know, have students who go through their school who are very talented, and like we wouldn't be for a moment claiming credit for those fellows' achievements. Would you like to think that? At least they may have absorbed something in culturally or uh, in terms of values that do uh, stand to them uh, in the context of the high end sport that they're competing in. Yeah. You know, obviously, Tyg Furlong isn't the rugby player he is because he came to Good Council College. Mm. But, you know, in terms of his rugby, but I know Tyg would have. A, you know, a very strong uh, sense of um, attachment to the school. Uh, and I'm sure there were other things that he acquired here in terms of the people he met, teachers who influenced him, that probably imbued him with other characteristics that uh, have stood to him in the highly competitive world that he's trying to uh, yeah. put it in. Yeah. And, um, you know, very often those strengths or those qualities are as important as the the, the skill set i mean yeah you know yeah. kevin doyle always struck me while he was here as just being somebody who was so solid grounded uh strong character i mean i'm sure he won't mind me saying i mean there were plenty of lads who went through the school probably as skillful as him in terms of what they could do with a football and so on but uh, once kevin got an opportunity and a door opened for him he wasn't uh, going to be denied pushing right through and uh, you know he really maximized uh, out on his uh, on his talent and you know it's a great credit to him the way he conducted himself always and the and the career he he, he carved out for himself phenomenal yeah. fantastic you know and uh, you know and and 
you see, I think even when it comes to coaching players and coaching young people, that's a, a dimension that is so important that yeah. they acquire sort of uh, values that allow them to, uh, uh, I suppose, capitalize on the talent that they have. Because you'll see a lot of talented players who just fall away because there are other dimensions that are not uh, taken care of. And that, um, you know, they, um, they just can't, you know, they don't have the perseverance. They don't have the uh, resilience. They don't have the, you know, the coping skills maybe that are required when it comes to trying to um, operate at the top end of sport. So, yeah, no, we've been very fortunate with the guys that have gone through the place and uh, I can't not uh, pick you up on that mention of uh, jockeys. Uh, <laughs> we have a phenomenal uh, association with horse racing and it's, again, just, I suppose, as much by um, just the, the geography of where we are and the, and the community that we serve. But, yes, yeah, so, so Aidan O'Brien has been in school here uh, uh, the horse trainer and uh, he uh, the, o- the other Aidan O'Brien the, the, the yeah the uh, <laughs> uh, fairness uh, you know currently we'd have a lot of the top jockeys in Ireland I mean Shane Foley was second in the um, in the uh, jockeys the uh, flat jockeys championship this year he's won a couple of classics Shane was here uh, Sean Flanagan is leading national hunt jockey at the moment in Ireland Sean was here Jonathan Moore was here Tom O'Brien, a leading jockey in England. Tom Doyle. Mm. I mean, I'm leaving out people now, but there, uh, there are a lot of young apprentice jockeys at the moment in Ireland. John O'Connor, uh, Mikey Sheehy, Danny Sheehy, all came to school here. I would say of any sport, our uh, influence in racing is greater than in any other sport. And it's yeah, phenomenal, yeah. actually. And people often say, you know, they're, they're, they're gobsmacked that so many of those guys all came to the same school. And, yeah, you know, I, I was just looking at the Melbourne Cup there last week or before, and the guy leading in the winner was a good council pass pupil. The guy who led in the winner the year before was a good council pass pupil. Yeah, the year before that, the winner was owned by two lads who went to school here, and it's just, I think, out of four of the last five Melbourne Cups on the other side of the world, we had a very direct association with the winning horse. Yeah, Jordan, you know, it's extraordinary because. I wouldn't even know that, you know, and, and you, uh, you'd be steeped in the sport of the school and everything like that. But like, I'm sure people are, were, are looking at good council and saying, well, what, what are they doing down there? You know, producing these well, jockeys and trainers. Yeah. Well, obviously, look, we don't, there's no school sports in, 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 yeah. in, 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 in racing, but there are inter-schools show jumping and, um, yeah. Uh, and, and then current trials and that kind of stuff. And that would be, I suppose, just some, you know, be a partly uh, hmm. uh, responsible. But look, at, I mean, I obviously, as you know, ha- have a, a passion for horse racing. <laughs> and it would be my, my number one uh, sporting love, yeah. really. And yeah. I mean, I have brought boys uh, on tr- school trips over the years down to Aiden and Bally Doyle to Jim Bulger's, to Michael Halford's, to um, Jessica Harrington's. And I've obviously brought groups over to Aintree. Oh, God, I don't know how many times now over the years. Yeah. And some of those <laughs> fellows have maybe, I, I do know, let's say, that you know, someone like Shane Foley, I, I know his experience in going down to Bally Doyle and going to Aintree uh, did influence his thinking around uh, you know, getting into, into racing. And there are others too. I remember coming away from Bally Doyle one day having had the boys on a tour down there and meeting Aidan and everything else. And there was a, a lad sat beside me, a young fellow on the bus on the way back up. And he said, oh, when I get out of school, I want to work in a place like that. And mm-hmm. he did go on to have a very uh, uh, prominent career uh, working in racing after. So, you yeah. know, I suppose these are the kind of experiences beyond the sort of the, the narrow uh academic experiences of a child's uh, life in a school that can um, add value, if you like, to their um, to their holistic development, I suppose, to, yeah. to use that well-worn phrase. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. It's, it's interesting because in 2007, I think spring of 2007, Bilo, Paul Beelan was manager of, of Wexford and he brought us, it was the weekend of a training camp we were having down in Limerick or Clare 
and on the way in Tipperary, we stopped off in, in, in I hope I'm getting this right, in Coolmore Stud, and we, we went in and met um, the other Aidan O'Brien, and it was probably before the period where you went and listened to people from other sports and from business, and like nowadays, every f- football you know, team, every soccer team, rugby, are learning from people in business and other sports, but back then it probably wasn't done as much but it was just brilliant to hear that he had a horse. He, he was showing us a horse uh, that was, you know, worth 20 million euro or whatever it was. Mm. And he, he was telling us how he navigated training the horse, um, uh, dealing with the owners, dealing with the, the, um, the owner of Coolmore Stud. And, yeah. you know, it, it, was, it was just fascinating to hear like that, they were operating at such a high level and, and to get some information uh, from people like yeah. that is, is incredible. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, I mean, I, I have been fortunate enough to have spent a few mornings with Aidan down in Ballydoyle and the Gallops and what have you. And I mean, it's a fascinating, for me, obviously, because I'm interested in it, but just to spend time with Aidan and to, you know, to observe him and to listen to him and to sort of um, just reflect on the way he does things. And I mean, mm. what I found with him is that one of the things that strikes me about top class coaches, he never doubts himself. He, mm. Like Aidan might be talking about a particular method that they're employing in, at that particular time and something that they're doing. And you'd be sort of thinking to yourself, I'm not sure that makes great sense or whatever. That doesn't necessarily, I'm not sure if that would be a great, but he's yeah. absolute. And once he um, is committed to a particular way of doing something, it strikes me anyway that there is no prevarication. He doesn't say, I wonder, am I doing it right? Or gee, I wonder, do I need to, you know? And I mean, obviously in that game, no more than any game, you're going to be, you have as many, if not more defeats than you have successes. Yeah, and I suppose the danger is when you lose, and this goes for any sport that you start questioning: Were we doing things wrong? Do we need to change things? But I think with Aiden, no, just he, he's he's committed to a way of doing it. He, yeah, he's satisfied that it's the right way to do it. He believes in it, and he pushes on with it. Yeah, and I think that was something that uh, I felt was uh, was valuable and uh, worth um, worth noting. Yeah, and and. I, I might have mentioned this to you before. I mean, look at reflecting on 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 horse racing vis-a-vis coaching and everything else in terms of football or soccer or any of the games that we would be involved in. Like, I was reading a book there last year by a, a lady called Henrietta Knight, and what it was was a book where she visited. I think it was twenty-five of the top trainers across Ireland and England, horse mm. trainers. And Aidan O'Brien was one of them, and Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott and Nicky Henderson over in England and so on. But the thing that was most striking was that every single one of them did things completely different. Yeah. They had different, they had completely different setups. Willie Mullins's and we and I've had a group of boys there, his gallop is as flat as a pancake. Uh, Joseph O'Brien, it's like climbing Mount Ider. Um, uh, Gordon Elliott has a different setup again. They all have completely different arrangements. They do things very differently, but yet all of them are supremely successful. And I think the thing that it sort of said to me is that ultimately there isn't only one way. Mm. And I think very often in football or in team sports, we get, very much suckered into the idea that there's only one way and it's the way that currently let's say that Dublin are doing it yeah or at another time the way that Tyrone were doing it or Donegal mm. and of course that's not true at all yeah I mean you have to find a way that's best for the group that you have yeah and um you know Jason Moore is a good friend of mine uh, you you know Jason yeah. I think uh, and I mean, we often chatted about this kind of stuff and Jason always said to me that, you know, coaching and training is as much, it's as much art as it is science. Mm. And I feel that in current, uh, in the current era, there are a lot of coaches who have uh, maybe 
put far too many of their eggs into the basket of science mm. at the expense of the art. Yeah. And, you know, what I mean by that is that, you know, you can have all the GPS data you like, you can have all the stats you like, you know, you can have all of the science and the testing done, but sometimes you have to be able to sense uh, maybe we need to, you might have a session planned to do X, Y, and Z, and yeah. you may just have to say, no, mid-session, I'm leaving Z out tonight. Yeah. Because I feel that, just think it's the right thing to do. And, you know, even with players at an individual level, I think you have to be able to sense that maybe a different approach is required here. You know, that this guy doesn't need to do what we're all doing. He can drop it out of this session or take a break entirely you know i think that that's important to keep that in mind that when you're coaching that you know you um have a you have to have a feel for it as well as uh having you know the knowledge that comes with the you know the the the, the learning that you've done in terms of qualification one. Yeah, I don't know if you'd agree with me on that, but it's certainly <clears throat> something that uh, I would be quite um, uh, adamant about. Yeah, no, I, I would actually, and I, it might be strange coming from a sports science background, and it's something that I would battle with on a day-to-day -day basis because in my full-time job, we're we're coming with the science and the GPS analysis and saying, well, this session was below what was planned or it was higher, or there's, there was more sprint distance in that session than, there, you know, than we had planned, or there was not enough accelerations, decelerations. And knowing from my London days when I was coaching, well, mid-session, mid you just you ripped up the plan and you changed it completely because you just had a feeling from the team that I'm not going to do that, actually. This is what they need to focus on. Or maybe we're going to cut this session short. Or maybe we're going to go halfway through the session. Do you know what? Let's just go into a game. Uh, we're not getting what we need to get out of this this practice. So it's 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 a battle. I I, I recently did it in, uh, the with the GPA a, a professional certificate in leadership, and it was a, it was a brilliant course, absolutely brilliant course. And it was one one day every month, and I used to fly in from London for the day in 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 Dublin Airport. Uh, they held it in a hotel and the great thing was that they used to bring in people from all walks of life who've been successful so you know the ceo of some of the biggest companies in ireland the ceo of Aer Lingus came into us at, at one stage and and like you say there was there was never one way of doing things you know mm. one one guy was hard-nosed very high expectations pushing the staff the other the, the, the next lady was, you know, really uh, put a big focus on kind of the sociable part of the, the, the business and everybody getting on well together. And so it's, 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 it's very interesting. And uh, sorry, one other character I'd mention, like we all know him, Harry Redknapp, like he was at QPR. And now if you were to watch one of Harry's sessions, first of all, he didn't coach. <laughs> but also his the, the coaching sessions I mean you would see an under 12 coach doing the same thing maybe down the yeah. local pitch there was nothing special at all but yet Harry had a way of getting a team playing for him and he knew how to match up forwards with forwards or a centre back pairing or so he had a feel for the game and a feel for that performance oh, I got I, that's really the point I'm making now that's not to say that obviously you know it's very important that we uh, embrace the science to support uh, what you're doing I mean there's no question that uh, you know sports science has allowed players to become so much um, stronger so much faster uh, so much more uh, you know, athletic than would have been the case when I played. I mean, and uh, there's no question that it has done that and it has, as a, as a consequence, made the games 
you know, more uh, dynamic and, and what have you. Um, but I, I think there's also that element that sometimes gets lost um, whereby, you know, especially young people who want to start coaching. I mean, they do the courses and they do a lot of learning and, they, they, you know, they, they have their S&C guy in and all the rest of it. But, you know, there's, there's a dimension to it that, that can't almost, it's almost instinctive or that mm. they've got to, you know, develop by true experience, I suppose, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, I think like the Harry Redknapp is, uh, is, is, is an extreme example of, of, of it, but you're right. I mean, mm. Harry seemed to get great, uh, great re- results and uh, players did seem to play for him and yeah. that's, that's critically important. Yeah. Yeah, well, one one thing because a lot of young sports scientists would contact me and ask about, you know, advice in their career or what what would you um, recommend to do, and I'd always say, okay, make sure get your get your sports science degree or maybe your masters or whatever it is, but number one, get out and coach, and it doesn't have to be S and C coaching. Preferably not, but just coach in whatever sport, whatever age, and going along and teaching a a five year old to to you know bounce the ball and kick it mm-hmm. and solo. I mean, that's that's coaching in its purest form. Yes, and 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 look at I wouldn't have any fountain of wisdom in in relation to it, and there are ten times better coaches than I. But I mean, I always think also because people would ask you know for bits of advice from time to time and they'd ask you for example do you do you know of any drill that i could use to develop this that or the other and if i if i i might tell them well this is what i would do in this situation but what i would usually tell them is try and come up with one yourself because if i am looking to try and um target a certain uh principle or a, a certain aspect of a game or whatever I like to come up with a, a, a set up a, a drill I don't like the word drill but a, 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 a phase of play that I'd like to come up with myself because then I feel I have had to think about this from the point from the starting point of what is it I'm trying to achieve mm. and I go back then from there to try and make sure that what I'm doing, what I'm putting in place, is designed specifically to achieve the goal that I have set myself in terms of the coaching. And I think that you can never adapt, take a drill that someone else is doing and really own it. Yeah. And that's why almost every drill that or every uh, piece of work that I would have done, in you lads and horse wouldn't so on, I would have, um, you know, come up with them myself largely, you know, because. Uh, I think that way you are doing things that you're doing with a particular purpose in mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a good point. I think we'll go into that. We'll, we'll have a, just a really quick break for a word about the sponsors and we'll, we'll come back and uh, get into some of the coaching thing just to finish up. This episode is sponsored by RIPT, who have come on board with us. RIPT is a platform that connects coaches with their clients and athletes. Using RIPT, coaches can create individualized training programs and monitor their clients' progress via the RIPT app at www.ript.app, where they can track exercise, training loads, and very importantly, well-being data. RIPT is used by high-performance teams such as Swim Ireland and Kerry GA, and also by gyms and online coaches to manage their clients. We're using it ourselves for the new DSS online training service, where you can have your own personal trainer and SNC coach to help you get fit and ready for the season, or just lose weight and get fit. We have a special offer for coaches over on our website, where you can get two months free access, access to RIPT, just head over to our podcast page on dailysportscience.com forward slash pod and you'll find a link to sign up for that two months free access. If you'd like some more information on RIPT as a service, just go to www.ripped.app to read more there. Thanks again, guys, for your support.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, I'm here with Aidan O'Brien. Aidan, you, you've been, you won't like to say it, but you've been highly successful practically with every single team that you've gone into. Uh, luckily for, for me and my old teammates with Hoare's Wood in Wexford, we won a, a, a nice few county medals um, for the first time ever in our history. But even places like with Adamstown, with lots of other clubs, uh, with Mullinavat last year, I know you got involved a little bit in the, the Leinster Intermediate Championship um, with Good Council, obviously. I thought you did very well with Wexford when you were uh, manager of the Intercounty uh, as well, and a little bit unlucky in some of the games. Like, I'm interested, and you, you had said previously about that, well, you have to have your own way of doing things or your own philosophy. Something that I've always noticed, and many of us who know you have noticed, is that in all those teams, the players always really wanted to play for you. They always dug deep, and you could, if you saw a Horswood team perform in Wexford Park, you'd say, well, that's an Aidan O'Brien team. Well, look, at I, I can't really say it, but uh, um, look at I, I would just feel that in terms of teams that I've been involved in, I've just... I, I feel genuinely that I've just been in the right place at the right time, been lucky. I mean, coming to the school here, obviously, was, uh, you know, there was, a, a, the potential was enormous. And uh, I suppose it was great that we managed to uh, to, to catch in on that. Um, my experience with Horace Wood, which, you know, can reference that because obviously you were part of it. Um, look, again, there was a, a great bunch of players there. Um, I suppose, you know, I suppose the question you're asking really is, uh, you know, trying to have a team uh, perform uh, and play for you. Well, look, I, I can only say that I, as, a, as, as, a, as a coach, I mean, I would always try to um, set high standards for myself in terms of my commitment, uh, my attendance, my timing, my... The, the the thought going into into um uh, preparing sessions all of that kind of thing and yeah. I suppose that sets a certain tone and I suppose players then feel that if you're doing that that you're obviously very committed to what you're doing there's no sort of um half measures there's no uh, questioning of your uh, enthusiasm for the project I mean I know that. A few little things. I mean, I remember one time um, uh, coming down to take a session with the guys in Horace Wood. Um, uh, I was away in, for a week or two up in Armagh at the time. I was up in Armagh for the week, uh, where my wife is from. And uh, I came down on the turtles and I up again. And uh, people were saying, geez, you didn't need to do that, you know. Yeah. Some of us would have taken the session. Whatever. But I couldn't think like that. I, yeah. And I knew other people could have taken the session and could have done it as well. Yeah. But I felt, I suppose, that, look, this is an opportunity for me to send a very strong signal to the group that this is how far I'm prepared to go. Yeah. And, you know, and I suppose it sort of, uh, it, it, it also, I suppose, makes it more difficult maybe for the players that feel that they can take shortcuts or be less than fully committed if if you're seen to to, to put in that sort of self. And you know, I think obviously being personable, being you know, treating players with respect, I think, yeah, is, is critical. And uh, like I have a daughter who has started teaching her in the last few years. And I mean the only advice I give her is that look obviously you need to know your subject. You need to be very well prepared, but most importantly, establish a relationship with your students. Yeah. And if you do that, teaching is a pleasure, and yeah. uh, you'll get them to work with you, and you'll get them to work for you. And you know, it, it just it, it's a much more rewarding um, career. And I think the same is applies in coaching. You know, you have to um, you have to form relationships with the players. Now, obviously. That's easier done in certain circumstances than others, and yeah. it's, it's it's quite easy to do it at a school level because you're working with young people that are here all the time, and obviously 
your relationship is, is, is certainly with Abbott. Anyway, and at the club level, there's a degree to which I had an advantage in a club like Horace Wood because many of the lads were, were, were past pupils of the school here, and most of them, I would say, in fact. Yeah. Um, so that was obviously a help. And um, I suppose even, you know, uh, working with other clubs like um, <clears throat> over the years, you just like to think that if you if you if you set the right tone in terms of your own approach in terms of the uh, look professionalism isn't quite the right word but yeah in terms of just the fundamentals doing the fundamentals really well and uh, obviously then as i said that element of forming a relationship with your parents and that doesn't have to be you know that that's that's something that again you need a sort of a it's 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 an art in itself i suppose you know not every player can be treated the same that might sound sound like the wrong thing but you know you can't i always think that you can't um handcuff yourself to a set of rules that are absolute and that are unwavering in terms of how you uh, react and respond to different situations and different players. I mean, certain players need different handling and different set of a different approach than others. And the same is true even at, at clubs. Different clubs, you know, respond to different things differently. And like, it's not like you'd be getting, um, uh, you know, particularly friendly on a personal level with players or anything. But yeah, you know, you'd you would get to know them and 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 have respect for them and uh, you know yeah. even though you might uh, give out to someone in the context of a of a, a session and the, the effort they were putting in or whatever it, they would understand perfectly that it wasn't a personal thing and you'd obviously then maybe counteract that at a later stage in the session by finding something to complement that same player on you know so that yeah. you immediately diffuse any sense in their mind that you know he doesn't care about he doesn't he's not interested in me or he thinks I'm not up to it or anything like that yeah and yeah. you know I'm being perfectly honest with you like I mean there's no doubt I mean for me that is becomes a much greater challenge when you move to adult inter county like I had the under 21s in the county there at one stage and uh, that was you know that was never there was no issue but seeing your inter county team is much more of a challenge in relation to the point we're talking about here because yeah. you're dealing with players who have uh you know uh more uh, maybe a greater sense of entitlement uh, who uh, obviously by virtue of the fact that they're with the county team are obviously all top class players they have achieved a lot with their clubs they've never experienced maybe a situation with their clubs where they wouldn't be automatic selections that kind of thing and you know just trying to manage the dynamic of that i found uh, it's most challenging at intercounty level and like obviously brian cody I, I i often think about brian cody and what he has done in kenny hurling and I, I I think for me Cody's greatness is the, is very similar to Aidan O'Brien, the horse trainer's greatness. And it is just the staggering capacity to keep coming back year after year and just with the same hunger and determination and drive and enthusiasm. Yeah. I mean Brian Cody, Aidan O'Brien could easily be forgiven for hanging up their boots several years ago and their record would be extraordinary yeah. but there is never a, a dropping of standards or a dropping of the relentlessness in terms of in the pursuit of, of of success now the point i was going to make is like in reflecting on brian cody like he in his early years was in a position where he had tremendous talent available to him and was able to, to drop a few players like we remember Charlie Carter and yeah. Brian McAvoy. And obviously once that happened and they succeeded, I mean, his position was yeah. sort of enhanced and strengthened tenfold. I mean, he became 
he got into he was in a position where he was omnipotent i was to guess yeah well obviously i i suppose if you're in the in the happy position that you can do something like that it obviously strengthens your position as a as a, as a manager um, and allows you to um you know i suppose uh you know cement your position in in relation to you know uh being beyond if you like you know the rumbles and questioning that would typically uh, happen in a in, in in a group i mean i suppose <clears throat> Yeah. Look, group dynamics are a whole study in themselves, and I mean it's a fascinating area. And I mean, I remember, you know, in college when you studying sociology, when you know, looking at groups, and you know, when any group is comes together, if you brought any random group of people together who, let's say, were uh, abandoned after some sort of a disaster, I mean, people who emerge as leaders initially won't necessarily be the people who will ultimately lead the group. Yeah, you know the, the the loud, the brash will be the ones that will obviously take hold in the early stages. But the more considered and the more uh, resourceful will be the people who will ultimately be the, yeah. be the leaders. And I suppose you know when you're working with a group of players, I mean, naturally you're dealing with uh, people who uh, you know are there because they have uh, you know. Uh, high level of ability they have achieved quite a lot many of them uh, you know have strong egos and you're going to disappoint people and yeah. i suppose managing that side of things is always a challenge you know i mean <clears throat> for any manager i mean and i mean i'm talking about management now rather than coaching but for yeah. managing a situation like that you know and trying to ensure that the disappointed don't uh, become uh, uh, a negative mm. uh, voice or a, 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 a sort of a, a lightning rod for others to join uh, as a sort of a, a negative uh, subtext in everything you're doing. That's a challenge, you know, and yeah. it's inevitable that if you don't pick me to play on your team, that I'm going to be hurt and I'm probably going to gravitate towards some other fellow who wasn't picked and tell him that, in my opinion, he should be playing so that he'll tell me that he too, he too believes that I should be playing. And there's a little um, uh, uh, a, 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 a pair formed and it's not very difficult to draw others uh, to join in. And, um, you know, combating that sort of uh, challenge in a group such as a, a squad yeah. is is really important it's that you manage that well and that you get on get that deal with that and yeah. i think i mean you managed in london and i'm sure you probably came across that challenge uh, and you know it's like when you're winning and you're successful yeah. obviously it spikes the guns of the disaffected but yeah. when you lose well they now have uh you know a position from where they can say well if i was playing or if you had used me or if you had done things differently well we would have won you know and yeah. you know it's like the hurler and the ditch you can never you can never prove him wrong uh, you know because he you know you're the only one that's in the position who uh, that has to make the calls and it's your decision and only that that will be uh, judged ultimately but yeah. you know i, I suppose I'm not sure where I've started with this whole point, but for me, uh, you know, coaching is one thing, but managing is a different thing. And, and, and like I often think that most guys who end up managing uh, inter-county football teams or hurling teams actually started life as coaches and yeah. it's coaching that I really wanted to be doing. Yeah. And coaching that I most enjoy uh, uh, as opposed to managing the team. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think perhaps that's um, a certain, as there's a certain curiosity about that in Gaelic games, you know, that, yeah. as I say, most managers actually were... They're, they're coaches. Really, no. Yeah. I think it, for, for me, being involved with London, that was the part that was the hardest and the least enjoyable, is just 
dealing with on a day-to-day basis the disaffected, the players who weren't playing, the players who weren't in the match day squad. I mean, there were so many things to manage uh, alongside making sure, you know, everything is okay with the coaching and the logistics and the operations and the food. And on a yeah. day-to-day basis, you had to manage that. And what I found, which you alluded to, it's so easy to get tripped up on it. You know, one wrong word or something that you say to a player and they take it up in a certain way. It's, it's, it's a minefield and it's, um, I suppose not everybody ha- has the luxury of being able to drop, you know, multiple all Ireland win players like Brian Cody could and, and, and Jim Gavin could as well. I, I want to go back to just briefly, Aidan, to a couple of really interesting points that you made uh, at the start of that where you said about showing that commitment because in the current era of kind of high performance and sports science and everything like that, it's such an easy thing for people to say and to put up on walls and signs and everything like that about show commitment. But I think it's another thing for the coach to actually live that. And I think that that was something about you as a coach always in that, and you showed some examples of actually following through and being always early and going the extra step. And I think players, they, they notice that and they see how much it means to them and they see how much kind of um, embedded you are in this and in this journey. And it, it affects them, I think, in, in a positive sense. Uh, well, I think it, I, I would agree. And I know that personally you'd be more inclined to um, uh, be impressed by uh, somebody who displays that quality, whether it's in their work uh, here or whether it's um, in any other area of life. You know, I mean, you know, Aidan O'Brien, we've mentioned him a number of times, but he or his ilk could be forgiven for having a lie on and yeah. uh, letting the lads uh, run work with the horses and uh, getting up at nine or ten o'clock. But I can assure you, he's the first man up around uh, Ballard Oil every morning. And yeah. that means every morning. He actually said to me once, the only time I leave here is to go to the races and go to Mass. And, <laughs> uh, that's, and that's like, and, and it, you know, there are lots of uh, archetypal stories about Aidan. You know, he'd be racing in Royal Ascot to have a winner and he'd be back in the yard at five o'clock that evening, you know, having yeah. thrown home. So, nice. And that kind of commitment to what he's doing is, is I suppose, what we're talking about. And yeah. I, I no doubt all the top guys and all those most successful coaches exhibit that in what they do. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, it's, I, I think it's fundamental. I think it, it has to be there or, or else you're really at nothing. You're going to lose, you know, confidence uh, of the players. Like, I suppose when you're coaching, you're trying to inspire players mm. to go to places that aren't easy go to you know, to push themselves to the limits that are, that are, that are hurting them, you know, and if you were asking players and, you know, somehow requiring and demanding the players go to that sort of extreme, then you have to be able to show them something in yourself that uh, uh, sort of reciprocates that. And that would be the way I would uh, feel about it. I mean, I know I, I, I remember saying to a group one time at the beginning of a campaign, I said, look, I really hope I, I am never missing any session with you during the course of this campaign because you can take it that if I am, it's because somebody belonged to me has died. Yeah. And because, you know, I knew that I wouldn't be missing any session for any other reason, for a yeah. golf game or whatever the heck it would be. You know, it wouldn't, yeah. have to have made something bad and uh you know I, I didn't want that to be the case yeah um, so you know that would be i suppose my view on the kind of you have to be really committed as a coach because of the because of what you're expecting from the players yeah i mean you know and so listen isn't that the case in um in, in any area of life in, in yeah work i mean if you're a, a manager of a of a business and uh you're hardly ever in on time or you're hardly you're golfing half the time or you're not there much of it. I mean, 
it's gone to, it's bound to um it's bound to uh, uh send a signal to your employees and it's bound to have an effect on their levels of motivation in terms of their work and so on and uh, yeah. You know, uh, perhaps if Donald Trump had uh, spent less time on the golf course, he might have returned to, he might have returned to the White House. <laughs> well, we don't we don't know for sure whether he's not going to return to the White House in January, but let's oh, yeah. hope not. I, th- I think it's a, it's a good summary point as regards like people and coaches can get so obsessed about this marginal gains and stuff like that, and they forget those big rocks of good coaching, good players, you know, because without good players, you're not going to do anything. And then just that commitment and sacrifice and determination and hard work. Yeah, well, I, I sometimes, it goes back to an earlier point where we talked about the, the science and the art. Like, I do think sometimes coaches, there are some coaches who they attend to all the, the peripheral stuff. Mm. But, for, but take their eye off what the core business is, yeah. and that yeah. is the on-field work that they're doing, the coaching, yeah. the, you yeah. know, the, the fundamental stuff that's so important. Like you can have the best setup you like in terms of the, uh, the you know, the supports around that. But if that core business isn't good, well, then you're yeah. you're really not going anywhere. I mean. And look, it mightn't be a bad way to finish off, but we started this whole conversation uh, con- referring to uh, your former uh, school principal and my uh, <laughs> former boss, uh, Father John Cosgrove. Well, one thing that his mantra at the beginning of every school year at our staff meetings was, the quality of any service is at the point of delivery. <laughs> and I always thought it was a fantastic uh, uh, motto in that you take it in a a restaurant I mean you could do brilliant things back in the kitchen and have the best chef in the world and everything can be phenomenal and yeah. the ingredients but when that plate is delivered in front of the customer out in the restaurant it's only there that it really matters whatever went on previously is lost you know yeah. So that it's at the point of delivery that uh, that uh, that all quality that the quality of any service will be judged. You know. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's. I think that's a brilliant motto. Well, thank thank you very much for coming on. I think this has been a very personal podcast for me. I I hope uh, you've enjoyed looking back on your career. I I hope the listeners will enjoy it. I have a lot uh, to be very very thankful to you as a mentor for me as a player in colleges and in club I'm, I'm 100 sure i would never have been any way sex successful without your mentorship as as a player um and also as a coach as well in, in in terms of when i was with london i would often get on the phone or send a text message looking for a bit of advice about stuff and um i appreciated that always so anybody who's given out about what i'm saying out on twitter or dailysportscience.com or whatever Go and speak to Aidan O'Brien because he was the mentor. Yeah, I am taking no responsibility <laughs> whatsoever for any of your shortcomings. <laughs> uh, neither would I take any credit for all that you've achieved from having your own back. And, uh, look, of course I've enjoyed the conversation because I suppose there's none of us that uh, don't enjoy uh, you know, a little trip down memory lane from time to time. And it's not something I do very much and yeah. I don't uh, swaddle myself with uh, memorabilia or anything yeah. like that. Um, you know, I don't have many pictures or anything like that adorning my house. Or anything like yeah. that. I, yeah. I, you know, it's in my mind. I remember the good times and I don't need that. Uh, but it's lovely to, to think back on some of those, uh, some of those times that we, that we shared, yes? Great. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I hope when, when, we, when we roll out this vaccine or get over this um this very virus period will be we'll come back for a visit i'll have a little a little sri lankan english irish mixed heritage little brown boy for you to meet <laughs> back in wexford so we'll um fantastic, fantastic. We'll, we'll get and, a visit uh, in yeah yeah and, and look at i mean it's interesting that like 
you talk about maybe learning a bit from me, but the roles were reversed in the sense that I have taken the opportunity to visit you in the academy in Queen's Park Rangers and to see yeah. uh, what happens there and uh, to sort of take some uh, some learning from it. So yeah. uh, there you are, you know. Uh, uh, I have become the, the student you were the master. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we'll definitely end it on that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Aidan. Thanks for coming on. And we'll All the best, Aidan. Thank you. Soon. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I think they are cured. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Good to hear it. Good he tried to, to keep it quiet, but those weekends in the New Forest, we knew you wasn't going on your own, Joe. Exactly. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was dodgy. It was dodgy. 15 quid, Joe, per month. Not much. Yeah. Yeah, 15 quid a month, yeah. I've, I've had a look at, uh, I think, four or five of the positions, and I've never, ever seen, uh, you know, uh, as much detail in terms of the different positions in, in football, in Gaelic football, broken down into so much detail. So there's lots of, uh, as Ross said, it's gold dust. There's lots of great learning points there for coaches yeah. and managers. Great. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, enjoy the rest of the episode, everybody. The podcast, remember, dailysportscience.com and head over... Um, we've actually started a new offer for listeners to the podcast. So just use pod 20 as a voucher code to sign up membership and you get 20% off as well. So for any new members out there or relapse members, just use pod 20 and you get 20% off membership. A good time, as the lads say, Ross was saying with all the new CPD and everything. So a good time to join up. Okay, enjoy. <laughs>